Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here as usual with Jeffrey Poole and Joe Lalo. And we have a, a guest today. Uh, a couple people asked about editing, so we've got Joe's editor here and also a fellow science fiction author, Tammy Salyer. I said it right. Look at that. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to just kind of skim through her Amazon bio here, and then we'll start pumping her for questions on editing and writing. Um, and uh, Tammy is an ex-paratrooper with the 82nd Airborne Division, and her stories are often as gritty as a grunt's pile of three-week-old field gear. I liked that, so I had to share that. Uh, she's got a science fiction trilogy. Uh, the first novel, Contract of Defiance, uh, the, is out. Uh, actually, all three novels are out, and the, it's called the Spectra's Arise trilogy. And she'll probably tell us more about it and like how you say it and stuff. <laughs> so, um, Tammy, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm excited. All right. Uh, I guess I'm going to ask kind of just a couple questions on your background first, and then hand you over to the guys for uh, questions on all the good editing stuff. And uh, you know, especially uh, a lot of us are self-published authors, so it's important to put out the best quality product we can. So I think for new authors, they wonder if they can do it all themselves or should hire someone. And we're going to go over some of that stuff today. Um, but first, I'd like to ask you. Okay, first thing, paratrooper. How did you pick that? And I didn't even know you could do that as a woman. So I have to ask you, uh, what what was your background yeah. in the military? Yeah, that's that's actually a little known secret. Well, I mean, it's not a little known secret anymore. But um, I didn't know you could be a paratrooper until I joined the army, and I was like, I can do that. Yes, let me do that, please. Uh, so I I um I I was I'm one of those adrenaline nerds. I love to jump. I love. I started out rock climbing, and then I got into skydiving, and then I couldn't do it. I couldn't afford it, so I joined the army, and became a paratrooper, and and so you know that's that's old history now. Um, but yeah, I loved it. It was fun to jump. I hated the army. It was terrible. <laughs> so I didn't. Yeah. So I got out as soon as I could. All right. I've, always, I've always wanted to. I've always wanted to say that I jumped out of a perfectly good airplane while up in the air. Never had the guts to do it, but. One on my to-do list. Did you have a parachute? <laughs> no, no. Say I, something I want to say. I've able, I've been able to do is willingly jump out a plane, but yeah, not yet. I'm not. I recommend right, well, it. It's super fun. I was in the army for four years to pay for college, and there was no jumping. <clears throat> I was a computer tech, but uh, we did go rappelling once for fun, and and that was a blast. So I could see it, I guess. <laughs> oh no way! When when were you in? Oh, uh, 97 to 2001. Okay, okay. I was in from 96 to 98. So All right. we just kind yeah, of like yeah. overlapped a little bit. That's I had awesome. to get out once uh, once Bush got in because he might actually send us to war or something. So, But, um, yeah, no politics yeah. in the show. So uh, <laughs> I better jump to the writing. All right. I hear you. Um, <laughs> so you want to tell us a little bit about your uh, military sci-fi series and maybe how long you've been writing and kind of how you got started. Okay. You know, I think all of us can probably say and serious about it in 2008 or 9. And I got in on, on the self publishing bubble in 2012. I'd already written my first book and rewritten my first book and wrote it again and again and again. Um, and it finally seemed ready in 2012. Um, yeah, and did that answer the question? I'm totally spacing out. That's all right. My internet is being really flaky too, so I'm just going to ask you a couple more questions, and I'll hand you over to the guys. Um, so editing. Okay, okay, that's yeah, how did you get started with editing? Did that start at the same time as writing, or something later? Yeah, editing. Um, I've always been. Well, I, I used to be in research, behavioral science research, so I did a lot of technical editing since there since I got out of the army, essentially. Um, and then when I started writing fiction myself, I decided that writing it wasn't good enough. I needed it to be as good as possible. So I started sort of transferring my editing from technical to fiction. And then after I started, um, kind of when I started thinking about self-publishing, I started thinking make a career out of writing and not just my own writing because it is, as we all know, really difficult to make, uh, make a living as a writer, especially a self-published writer. So um, I wanted to make sure that my career was not just not 
um, reliant totally on my writing, and so I got into editing um, fiction, took a lot of courses, read a lot of books, and did a lot of editing for friends and, and critique groups that I was part of and stuff like that, and finally started freelancing about four years ago in fiction. So they the together really well, really well for me. All right, that's a great point that, you know, I think a lot of people dream of I'm going to make it full time just as an author, but that's it just takes a lot of work to get to that point, so I think it's really useful if you have another skill that uh, you can rely on, especially if you can freelance and kind of make it work with the author schedule and still give yourself time to write. That sounds like a great plan. Yeah, and the two complement each other so well that you can't be a, a good editor and not also have a real good handle on writing skills. You may not love to write yourself. They're, they're different in that way. Editing is much more technical and much more um, theoretical, and writing is obviously much more, is it right brain or left brain, the creative side? Right brain. Writing is much more right brain, and editing is much more left brain, but they do find that union where if you, if you can do them both, you feel, or you're, you're really able to just kind of, um, I don't know, make it work, find a career in it. All right. Well, I'm glad that you've made it work. That sounds like a, a great way to go. Lots of freedom to call your own hours and everything. Um, I'm going to go ahead and yeah. hand over to, to Joe right off because, like I said, my internet is not so great tonight. So he's going to ask you some editing questions. Yep. Okay. All right. We're going to start off with um, the you, you offer a lot of different types of editing. Like when when people say that something's been professionally edited, that has a lot of different meanings. So. Uh, you offer on your you, the services you offer are proofreading, copy editing, substantive editing, and manuscript evaluation. What are the key differences of these, and in what situations would you recommend each one? Okay. Um, wow, that's an answer, that's a question that I could spend all night on. Um, I'll try to do sound bites. Uh, substantive editing is often um, conflated with developmental editing, and depending on your editor. They can be defined the same, or they can be defined differently. You probably know this. Um, substantive editing is more big picture things. It's not down to how a sentence is worded, but more on how how does the plot flow, how is the pacing, are the characters strong, are the characters consistent. Um, it's a, it's a it's a very please look at a book. Um, it's, the nonfiction side has a little bit different parameters. Um, so we'll just talk about fiction because we're all fiction writers for the most part. Um, so substantive editing is the big is the first step if you are not a really um, experienced writer, if you're not a really strong writer, or if you're not a really sure writer. A lot of people need or want substantive editing or manuscript evaluating, which is kind of <clears throat> kind of a just a sub section of substantive editing, um, just to know if their book works. If, if the idea works, if the premise is strong, if, if people are going to like it, um, and if they have the skills to pull it off. So substantive editing is very theoretical, it's very analytical. Um, copy editing and proofreading are, are kind of the same, they're very mechanical, there's no, there is a little bit of creativity involved, but it's more is your grammar correct? Are you making, you know, are your characters, uh, not your characters, but character plot um, events are all the things consistent? So if you have something happen in 2012 on page 5, did it happen in 2012 when it was repeated on page 25? You know, those kind of sort of factual errors. Um, so the kind of people who need substantive editing are the kind of people who want their book to fit uh, the market. And the market for indies is very, um, kind of self-defined, as we've all probably learned in the last few years. The market for indies is much broader than the market for, for traditional publishing, and we have all created our own market and found people who like writing that's not sort of force-fed and force-fed into a, a mold. Um, and a lot of people have found success writing outside of those rigid guidelines that traditional publishing generally forces on us. So substantive editing has taken on a whole new form. It's, it's become much more um, fluid, and it's become much more flexible than it used to be, or not than it used to be, but than it could have been in the past. 
Whereas copy editing and proofreading are something that every book needs. You just you 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 know, as an indie, you want to create a product that is as good as what everybody else expects it to be. Um, who has come from a, a world of books that are 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 traditionally published or traditionally published. We have a sort of an obligation to create professional books. And if your books are full of typos or full of you know broken grammar or or even just um, like formatting flaws, then then we slipped, you know, and we need to to make sure that that's all correct. So those are the differences. Uh, manuscript evaluation, at least how I define it, is for people like you, Joe, and like you, Lindsay, and like you, Jeffrey, who have written a number of books and feel really confident that you have a good grasp of, of writing and um, just want somebody to kind of look at the big picture and say, oh, you, you, you slipped here, you slipped there, and you know how to fix it yourself. You don't need a coach. So there's that. All right. It's, uh, it's pretty clear. And i got to say that um, when I first started editing, I was not aware of how useful it would be. Like, when I was thinking editing, I was just thinking proofreading. I was thinking, well, you know, you use the wrong version of a homonym, and a, you know. But uh, uh, when I found it was like, well, this character, this is not really in this character's voice, or this character said this here and said that there. And also, by the way, just overusing certain words and phrases is the sort of thing I've noticed is caught yeah. a lot in copy editing. And it really, really helps yeah. out to find just an extra set of eyes for that. So. I'm, I, I was mostly interested in the substantive and uh, uh, manuscript evaluation at part of this question because I've never had either of those, and I wondered how useful they would be for me. So that was a very good summary of your services and of editing services overall. Yeah, Next question good. would be... Manuscript uh, evaluation. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, no, forget it. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, next uh, question is, uh, what sort of difference do you feel that editing can make to the marketing of a book? Uh, just overall, what, how, how, how do you feel that an edited book uh, is affected once it starts getting marketed? You know, you know, this is a hard one to answer. I have heard from a lot of authors who don't have well-edited books who are actually really successful, um, and there's some sort of magic. Something happened, and they just, like, you know, they, like, I think, um, oh, who was I listening to the other day? Uh, uh, I can't remember. Somebody who who just took off and their books were not they were full of typos and oh, I think it was a. Uh... All right. Anyway, I'll I'll think of it later and I'll let you all know. <laughs> um, somebody whose book took off and it was full of problems, but it was still the the writing was strong enough to overcome that, and um. And so I'd like to say that if a book's not well edited, it can't do well, but that would be a lie. Uh, I think that if a book's well edited and it's well written, it'll do better than it would otherwise. So, but I also think that the majority of writers who are in this this ocean of indies are doing themselves a disservice if they don't get editing, either just copy editing or line editing, um, or full on you know the whole gamut of substantive editing and line editing and copy editing and and um, proofreading. Because that puts them a step behind. So, if you if you really want your book to do well, then you you really need to make sure it's as good as it could be. So, yeah. That's been my observation. I uh, perhaps famously at this point, my first three books, the trilogy, which are still my biggest earners, were initially released edited just by me, and I don't really have the strongest uh, and and most mechanically firm grammatical skills, so they were full of errors. And I still sold relatively well, but every single review uh, pointed out the, ter the number of typos that were in them. So uh, I got them edited, and my overall star, like my, my overall ratings on average went up like a star. Like they went from being mid threes to mid fours. It was a very, very good change. So I, I can tell you that it's easier to sell a book that's in the four star range than in the three star range. So from my point of yeah. view, editing has had a huge marketing impact. Good, good. So yeah, I, I think that's that's probably going to be true for everybody. Obviously, anybody part. who can spin a particularly good tale, like if you are good enough, if you are a good enough storyteller, I'm sure you can overcome poor editing. But 
and no amount of exceptional editing is going to rescue a bad story. But uh, True, yeah. a, well, a well edited story that's also a good story is always going to beat the alternative. Okay, yep. and uh, so next question is Can the quality of a book impact the difficulty in editing? If it's too good and becomes too engrossing or too bad and therefore difficult to finish, like, do you ever find that just the story makes a book hard to edit? No, I don't think so. I would be curious to hear from other editors on that, actually. Um, you, have a very you have a very specific set of things you're looking for when you edit, and even the story itself cannot overshadow you know, the, the, um, the framework from which you work. So, so the answer is no. <laughs> you pay attention to, to the things that need to be there. There are certain elements to any book that have to be there. Okay, that's good to know. My, uh, my experience, I, I don't edit other people's stuff. Sometimes I will beta read their stuff, which you can sort of, when you beta read people's stuff, you can tell them, oh, your story is good, and here's what I liked about your story. But I, even when I'm editing my own stuff, if I, I find myself overlooking the potential flaws because I'm thinking more about what I'm reading than how the sentence flows. So I know that if I was an editor, I'd have a serious problem if I was too interested in the story. I guess probably I would be able to get through a story that was bad, but I have... I have overlooked errors in the same paragraph a dozen times just because I was too too interested in the subject of the paragraph than the the structure of your of your own work or of someone else's of my own work and someone else's like I do I've I've I have a website on the side that not so active anymore that was doing uh, reviews of games and I would I was the editor and therefore had to read everybody else's stuff, and I would half the time let it out with errors just because I was like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. I should play that game, as opposed to actually finding where the uh. problem is. <laughs> yeah. All right, um, yeah. moving on. How slavishly would you say an author needs to cling to grammatical rules? Because can, a grammatical, can grammatical accuracy sometimes come second to an author's voice? Um, yes, an, a grammatical accuracy can definitely stilt the sound, uh, the voice, the tone of a story, but also if you don't follow gram grammatical rules to a greater than a lesser degree, you're going to confuse people. I mean, people just understand language in a certain way. So a good editor is going to be able, like, I, I, am, I think this is, this is a question that's going to come up, but um, a good editor isn't going to make you adhere to every single grammar rule because nobody, every single grammar rule is, is more of a guideline to, to borrow from Pirates of the Caribbean. Caribbean. Um, grammar is, is optional in certain cases. You, of course, want the overall story to be, to be sensible, to make sense just in the way our brains work. You know, let's channel some Noam Chomsky. But, um, but uh, it, you can break those rules. They, there's, there's, there's so many ways that you can break those rules. And People understand it, so, so yeah, you don't have to adhere to grammar one hundred percent of the time, and nobody does. The book that does. Yeah. Okay, um, I, I, this is a little off my off my list, but I want to ask a few. I have heard there's a few grammatical usages that people call incorrect that I've heard aren't technically grammatically incorrect, one of which is ending a sentence in a preposition. Is that actually a grammatical no-no, or is it just sort of pedantic and, and uh, uh, you know, nitpicky yeah. to, to correct it? It's pedantic. Um, I think there was somebody who said something like, you can't do that in the 1800s uh, because they, you know, had to stick up their butt. But that's not true. Um, Ir ir irregardless is also one that people think is not a, a real word, but it, it kind of is. Language changes. Language is, is fluid. You can't... Uh, if, you, if we all spoke like Shakespeare spoke, then we would still be living in the Middle Ages. So, yeah, um, you can break change that used to be really strict but aren't anymore. And there are rules that, that exist in other countries for grammar um, that, that are not regular U.S. grammar. Um, I can't have an example. People 
um, in the UK. And, and of course, punctuation is very different. And there are a lot of diff words that are used very differently. Or not very differently, but somewhat different, which we would, we would take, you know, take exception to. Uh, but, but that's just how it is. You know, you just, language is not something that you can put boundaries on and say, this is how, this is how it is. Which is why we do it, right? This is why we write. Absolutely. Absolutely. Famously, no. the, uh, famously the, the, the meaning of the word literally has now been amended to also mean not literally. Right, <laughs> right. That yeah. one throws me off I still. Think, doesn't the oatmeal do a great uh, cartoon on that? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Another, just again, another one that's off my list in the same uh, same sort of line of questioning. The Oxford comma, which seems to argue, you know, cause a lot of arguments. Is it, like, what's your stance on the Oxford comma? <laughs> that's a great question, and I think every editor has one. I'm all for the Oxford comma. I think it's necessary. Um, but then if you, like, uh, there's different style guides. You know, there's the Chicago style guide, and there's the, um, the Associated Press style guide, and there's MLA, and there's uh, the New York Times has their own style guide, which is hundreds of pages. Um, so they all have a different stance on it. They all take a different position. It's political in a way. Uh, like AP, they don't like the Oxford comma. Um, but I can't imagine having a comprehensible sentence without it. So even an I'm going to amend out being fluid and, and language being fluid. Every editor probably has, like me, has their things that no matter, no matter how beautiful the sentence is, there may be something that that it, that looks wrong and will always look wrong just because I have that sort of anal retentive focus on it. But that doesn't mean I, I can't be moved. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I, I'm pro Oxford comma, by the way. I, a lot of people I know are. <laughs> And my favorite, my favorite sort of position on it is like I've heard people say, you know, you leave out the Oxford comma except when it's necessary for clarity. And my stance is, if having the Oxford comma is sometimes necessary, then why don't you just always use it? Yeah, exactly. Because necessary for clarity is well for an editor, it's particularly hard because if because if an author has one uh, has an intention of meaning, but I'm not aware of that intention and and I feel like it means something else, and I want to put a comma there, and then I, you know, you know what I mean? You know where I'm going with that? Yeah. So, yeah. Why not use it? Yeah, that's, that's, I agree. Um, all right, my last question, and this sort of flows from, from what we were talking about. Are there any grammatical misusages that are so ingrained in the modern language that correcting them produces language that seems wrong? Good question. Probably. Yeah. Um, I just can't tell you anything off the top of my head. Yeah, um, I, I I run into this more often with um, with uh, uh, <laughs> pronunciation. Well, things that seem wrong but aren't right, or seem right but aren't wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah. a tricky one for me. Oh, like there's pronunciation ones like the word f o r t e, as in a strength that you have, right? Uh, pronounce it's not my forte. And I've okay. seen mm -hmm. I've seen different editions of different dictionaries where the primary pronunciation was fort. And if I say it's not my fort, then people look at me funny. So I have to say it it's not my forte and I learned it differently. Mm -hmm. And the other one, by the way, is when there is a plot mechanism that makes something work, like it's called a we'll call it a deuce ex machina, right? The I believe mm -hmm. the proper Latin pronunciation is Deus es machina. Right, but if you mm -hmm. say that, no one knows what you're talking about. So these are the oh, things yeah. I run into, and I'm terrified that I'm going to run into a grammatical one where it's like, well, no, no, this comma is supposed to be here, but it looks wrong, so I'm going to take it out. Oh, come on, you yeah. haven't ever, well, you haven't ever, you haven't ever reworded a couple of sentences just to avoid something like that. I've done that a few times. It's true. I've done so as well. I've yeah. done. I've also reworded sentences back in the old days to avoid having to spell certain words. <laughs> I've done that <laughs> a couple of times. Well, there's a famous quote, and I don't remember who it's by, who says a synonym is just another word for a word you can't spell. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, uh, I I use the term porky pigging. When I come to a word that I know I'm not going to be able to spell or perhaps won't be able to use correctly, then I porky pig around it. I try it three times and then just pick a different one. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard it described like that, but I'll have to remember that. 
All right. Uh, that sort of hits the end of my list of questions, so now I'm going to toss it off to Jeff. <clears throat> All righty. Okay, my first question for you is when you're uh, – I guess I, I haven't really written this, wrote this one down yet, read this down. That's nice, talking to an editor. I say it wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, are, are, you, uh, are you always accepting new clients? I mean, or for instance, or can you only handle a certain amount of, of say, authors at the same time? Because I know it's got to take a little bit for each editing job. Yeah, um, that's a good question, really. Uh, it's, it is hard to bounce from, from book to book. Um, you know, you probably know it in your own writing. If you're writing a book in fantasy and, somebody, and, and, and you have a great idea for, for, say, a thriller, it's hard to shift your brain from fantasy to thriller. And it's the same thing for an editor. Um, I try to do one book at a time. Uh, but I, you know, I will occasionally overlap with different genres, different books, and I will occasionally fit in smaller projects in, in different books. But it's much easier, particularly for well, any kind of, anything really, substantive or copy editing. One project at Intel Continuity in order to make sure you don't miss things. Um, yeah, did that answer your question? It, it did, it did, and that leads me to my next question, which is why I thought of it. Um, do you take all genres? Or are, there, it's like, is there some that you favor more than others? And are there some that you go, <laughs> not going to touch it? Yeah, no, yeah. Um, I, you know... I grew up reading certain genres and because I love them. And fi science fiction, fantasy, uh, thrillers, um, and then I read a ton of nonfiction. But you can't, I don't think too many people are very adept at editing books in a genre that they haven't read widely in or that they don't really like. Um, for instance, I would never substantive edit a romance novel because I've never read a, a romance no novel. I know there are certain... Um, protocols that, that have to be fulfilled and there are certain requirements of plot and structure that, that romance requires. Same with like erotica or um, political thrillers, you know, medical thrillers. Medical thrillers is something I probably wouldn't touch because I don't read them and I don't know a lot of medical ology. <laughs> Lingo. Um, but I can do neologism, neologism really well. So, so, um, so yeah, there, I think if you, you know, for a person looking for an editor, you want an editor who knows your genre. Because a person who only reads science fiction can't do romance unless they also read a lot of romance. They, they just, they're totally different. And um, I'm not going to use the word tropes because tropes is too limiting. But there are certain expectations in a fan base for a fantasy novel that differ from a fan base in a thriller novel or differ, differ from a fan base in romance. So if you have the mental space to understand all genres and edit all genres, that's amazing. That's like a superpower. But I don't think most people do. Good to know. Yeah, so that's, that's always wondering about that. Is like, if, like if editors are like, will say, oh, yeah, sure, you got a book. Give it to my – fire it my direction. I'll see what I can do for you. But i got to imagine if you don't read certain genres, there's no point trying to figure out what to do with said genre there. So, uh, My next question. Can you give an estimate of how long a professional editing job would take for, let's just say, a book that has right around 100,000 words, assuming there's just an average number of corrections or mistakes that you have to make? How long would that typically take you? What kind of editing? Uh, let's do the, um, let's do like, say, for instance, the, the, like the copyright part of it. Not the, you know, the proofreading, yeah, the copy, or the copy editing. Not the substantive one. I can't even say the word. <laughs> How can I expect you to do it if I can't say the word? Okay, S substantive. That's the word. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, that, you know, um, 100,000 words for me to copy edit, I would say I can do about 10 pages an hour. So that would take me, I usually book about two weeks for that because um, when I copy edit, I also proofread. I never read a book once. I read it two or three times to make sure I get everything. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's a two-week, at least, depending on how many errors there are. Substantive editing is, is a complete, and I know you, you said not to talk about it, but I'm going to because I'm wordy. That's okay. Um, <laughs> substantive editing <laughs> is a totally, like, it's very difficult to estimate, you know, because... If you three had a book to substantive edit, and you've written so many books among the three of you, like, I don't know, 100 books or something, uh, you kind of get it already. Um, it would be quicker. But somebody who's, who's written their first novel and needs a lot of 
feedback and a lot of iterations, you know, it, it would take more time. So substitute, substantive editing is, is specific to, to the author and specific to the book and specific to the book length. That's a whole different thing. Yeah, that'd be like if I tried to get you to do the substantive editing on my first book, which right now I would classify as a no-no because I already know I goofed that one a few different places there. But you know, my fourth or fifth one, you know, it's, I was I would say I was getting better with it. But if you don't also mind me asking, how much would a, how much would you charge for say the copy editing of a hundred thousand word book? Uh, my rate is um, I should know this, right? <laughs> uh, my rate is three dollars a page. I always look at my own website. I'm like, oh, what do I charge? Uh, Three dollars a page, and a page is is 250 words. So you can you can do the math. Three dollars a page. That's not too bad. All right. Let's see here. All right. My next question: What advice would you give a new author who cannot afford hiring an editor? Oh, I mean, are you pro or against self-editing? I have a feeling you're probably against, and I'm personally against, even though I tried self-editing my first novel. And if you were to read my first novel, you would see why. <laughs> so I'm just curious what your stance mm. would be. Um, I think everybody is capable of writing a good book, and I don't think everybody needs to have their hand held. Um, that being said, I don't think everybody needs to publish the very first book they wrote. Um, I really think that people should write two or three books before they publish one. And this is all opinion, and everybody's different, of course. Uh, it always has because you just may not know. For instance, I'm going to go back to romance because it's 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 more it's one of the more stricter genres. Um, you just may not know that at the end of a, a romance, the the two people in the, the romantic relationship have to get together. That's just kind of a rule of romance. And you may have the greatest romance story ever. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up Thornbirds, which I may be the only one old enough to remember that. But like somebody dies at the end. And that's not strictly a romance. That's more of a dramatic literary work. And there are different fan bases with different expectations. I'm rambling. Let me get back to the point. Um, I think everybody can benefit from editing, but I don't think everybody needs editing to be successful. And the person that I was trying to remember earlier was A.G. Riddle, who he published his first book and made, I don't know, many thousands of dollars. It's a, it's a science fiction thriller. And he didn't have any professional editing, and he's, you know, he's doing wonderfully. Another one is Matthew Mather. He does incredible science fiction. He's never even taken, I don't think, a writing class, and he's, he's a full-time author. So um, you can do well, but you can also do better if you have an editor. Okay. All righty. Let's see here. What What do you think are some of the most common mistakes new authors make? Mechanically or substantively? I would say probably substantively because I, I know from my own personal experience when I wrote my first one, I was told I do, I think I remember the term correctly, it was called head hopping where I kept changing point of view too frequently. Uh -huh. And, uh, and yeah, I, I, had, yeah. I, had, I, had, I had probably... Right off the bat, ten different people all in the same first note when they started leaving me reviews, ten different people all say the same darn thing. And I was looking at it going, okay, well, I did not know that. And for you know, for my next book there, I made certain to stop essentially doing that so oh, often. I'm sorry, you can't. But, uh, but yeah, is it so, I mean, I was just wondering if, if you've noticed like same common mistakes that are re reoccurring through like most new authors. Yeah, for sure. Um, head hopping is a big one, definitely. A lot of people do that. But a lot of people can get away with doing that, too. Like, I think uh, uh, J.R. Martin does that. Or is it J? It's not. Oh, the guy from. Uh, Game, uh, the guy from he, Game I of haven't Thrones. read any of his books, but I think he does. Yeah, Game of Thrones. Isn't that terrible? I just conflated him with J.R. Martin or Tolkien. Anyway. <laughs> Um, so head hopping is a is a is a is a common one. Another one is 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 predictability. A lot of people write really obvious stories that that are not um, they they don't hold audiences in, in rapt because it, it's easy to see what's going to come. Um, and those are real real easy things to to learn to to not do. And then uh, just being boring. You know, a lot of a lot of people have a really wonderful idea of 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 what they want and what they're what they intend to say, but they don't quite have the capacity to say it yet. Um, 
And and uh, I think one of the things I did as a, as a new author is is write a book like a movie, and forget to make it like a book, and forget to be you know forget to have fun with fun with the words, and and you know be creative with just the way the story is expressed rather than the action involved in the story. But if, okay. if you're, you're not uh, harder to to be good, which is terrible grammar, what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just go no comprendo. Okay, now let's see. Uh, let's see. <laughs> when an author is shopping for an editor, what questions should be asked? I mean, how would an author determine an editor's skill level? Um, well, the first question, of course, to ask is. Do you like the genre that I write in, and do you read it in that genre? <clears throat> the second question is more, um, uh, you, you kind of want to have a rapport with somebody. You want to be able to take feedback from them. Um, you know, you want, you want somebody who can be kind and gentle with the way they give feedback, even if it's hard feedback to hear. So you kind of want to like your editor. You don't have to, but you, you kind of want to, because it makes it a lot easier to, to have a working relationship. Um, and that's not a, a simple question. That's more of a, 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 di a dynamic. Um, but also, it helps to have. Uh, it helps to, to when shopping for an editor. It's always good to um, pick up books that you know they've already edited, and see how how they are. See if you find a lot of typos and a lot of grammar problems, and if the if the stories are compelling. Um, uh, but the caveat to that is that a non-compelling story doesn't mean the editor didn't do a good job. It's just there's there's a you know there's a difference between the writing and the editing, and you never know in self-publishing, the book that comes out may not necessarily the book that be the same book that the editor worked on, and which is one of the beauties of self-publishing, because you may have a terrible editor who just screwed your book up and you threw everything they said away, but then you wouldn't put your, their name in it. <laughs> so the first question is, do you do my genre? And then it comes down to what's your experience level? Um, have you worked much in, in a, well, how long have you worked? Can you, you always want to get a sample, um, uh, particularly if you're copy edit together, if they're, they're two, or if they can kind of stick to your, to your intent and to your voice. And just somebody that you that you resonate with. All right. Let's see. My final question would be: Is uh, what red flags should an author look for, which would indicate an editor's skill level is not all that it's made out to be? Uh. Well, I guess um. The red flags would be. Like I said, uh, some so if you if you solicit somebody for a sample and if they say no, I won't give you a sample. Just hire me. Obviously, that's a red flag. Um, if they do a sample for you and it's completely just like they've rewritten it, uh, particularly with copy editing, if they've just rewritten everything that you've written and don't give you any explanation as to why and don't solicit your feedback on how you want it to sound, or words that you may prefer to use. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, like in fantasy, a lot of fantasy authors will capitalize certain words that are not strictly supposed to be capitalized. Like they'll say the king with a, K, with a capital K, but all the rule books say if it's just the king, it should be lowercase. But that may not be what the author wants to do, and that may not be in, the line, in keeping with the story. So, um, so a good, you know, one of the red flags is somebody just goes through and changes all of those words without checking in with you. Um, I work with a lot of authors who use British spellings, like they, they put the S on the end of towards, or they use the word amidst instead of amid. Um, and I never just change those. I always ask because you may be really trying to invoke this, this old world type of language, and if I go through and just Americanize everything, then I've lost your voice. So those kind of things. Very cool. Very handy. Um, that's my last question. Lindsay, I hereby turn it over to you. All right. Got the dog roaming around in the background, shaking her collar, so that should be good times. Um, just have a couple of closing questions that I kind of thought of while these guys were interrogating you. 
So if you don't want to answer anything, Great. feel free to <laughs> feel free to ignore me. But I think they're nothing like personal and deeply intimate. So <laughs> um, I was just wondering. I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your sample edits. So, um, do you charge for <laughs> do you charge for sample edits, or do you find most editors do, or is that a red flag, or no? no. No, uh, yeah, I don't think anybody should um, expect to be charged for a sample edit. You're 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 trying to find out if you want to pay them, and if they're not willing to give you a, kind of a, a lead on on how they work, then you may not want to pay them. All right. But um, for me personally, my sample edits I'll I'll usually do up to like five pages for copy editing, because any more than that, and and for authors who uh, who um, who are looking for an, for a copy editor. Never give them your best five pages because that's not a, that's not a good representation of the whole work. Give them something from the middle, not the beginning, because we've all worked on the beginning like a hundred times. All right, that's a good tip. <laughs> yeah, I actually remember something on Kboards where like some author was getting a sample edit um, from like thirty different editors, so they got their whole book done for free or something, but they got outed. So. <laughs> oh yeah, no, oh, that's terrible. Um, yeah, I think that would not be a very consistent product overall in the end. But um, what are your thoughts on uh, beta readers? Is that something you recommend that uh, authors kind of have beta readers go over the work before they send it to you, or, or do you not care? Or what, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, it depends on the kind of editing. Um, I think it's probably better to get substantive editing before you have beta readers do it, because substantive editing will make sure your story follows a good structure. Beta readers generally, and it depends on who they are, of course, um, they, they just tell you what they like. Uh, they just tell you what works for them, and they don't know how to articulate what's not working. So even if they say, uh, I didn't like the love interest between Jack and Sandra, they can't tell you why. Um, and then you're kind of stuck with, all right, how do I fix that without without um, a more professional understanding of how you fix that. I, I know I'm not articulating that very well, um, but I think a substantive editor can say, well, the reason that's not working is this, whereas a beta reader can only say, it's just not working. Um, but I think beta readers are fabulous. I think everybody should have them, and, um, and they also make you feel good most of the time, so it's kind of a good ego boost. <laughs> Yeah, I think it can kind of depend. I found most of my beta readers through writing workshops, so actually they tend to be the hardest people to please because they're other writers. So <laughs> they'll be quoting the rules at you, and uh, uh, but I think that's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all my beta readers, um, or not all, but but like uh, I'd say half of, of my beta readers are, are other writers, and you're right, they are the hardest on me, and they they make me want to kill them sometimes. But they're right. They're usually right. <laughs> I was wondering if you're aware of, because um, I've heard of things, but I've forgotten them now, any uh, software that you would recommend, that, especially for people who maybe can't afford substantive, su I see I can't pronounce it either, substantive? Ah. <laughs> you're not alone, Jeff. <laughs> um, but for people who are really trying to save money, uh, any thoughts on the editing software that's out there? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't use it. I, I don't, I don't, um, I know that there's one out there called Autocrit, uh, that a few people have talked about, which I think finds, um, words that you've used repetitively and probably sentence fragments and things, but, um, I, I mean, because I, I can't imagine doing any, because you want, you form certain says to say a certain thing and to to invoke a certain feeling, and and editing software is computerized. Right. So I think there's. Out of that. I think there's a limit to how much a computer can do, but I have heard people say that it can help them. Yeah, kind of find the repetitive words or, and somebody was just talking about doing like a word cloud thing that you feed your whole manuscript into and it tells you like, oh, you used the word anything. 563 times and cut down on that. Yeah, yeah, and that's super helpful. Yeah, uh, one thing that I do do, what I do uh, for my own writing is that I'll write a scene, and then I will um, let my Mac read it to me, or I'll let my iPad read it to me, just to kind of understand the like make you know just to listen to the pacing and listen to the the, 
the way, like the length of sentences, what's too short, what's too long, is it too broken, is it too, word, you know, do I have a paragraph that's 14 sentences long but it's actually all one sentence? Um, so, I mean, that is a computer voice, but it will, but it, it definitely helps me. Right. I've heard people too, like, well, even the Kindle can read something out loud. So, like, before you're going to publish it, because sometimes you know how you, uh, no matter how many times you read the paragraph, you do not see that missing word or the extra the in there or something. In, but hearing it read out loud will obviously yeah. highlight that. <laughs> yeah, that too. All right. Uh, my last major question for you is just kind of as an author and as an editor, uh, coming back to the marketing topic and publishing in general, what are some of the changes you've seen in the last uh, few years and what do you think is going to, I don't know, be working for, for authors going ahead? Going ahead? Uh, oh, God, predictions. That's not my forte. <laughs> ha, <maybe I> do. <laughs> um, you know, I've only been doing um, fiction editing for, for mass market for a couple of years. So the last couple of years it's been um, pretty consistent. I know that I'm reading a lot these days about how this year is going to be much harder for self-published uh, self writers to make a go of it um, because there's more of us and the quality overall is rising because people realize that the, competitive, the competition is so high um, so they have to do better. I think that's good too though because the people who are doing better and who are writing better are, um, are going to stay at the top and others will just get better but it'll take longer. Um, so big changes, I, I haven't seen too many big changes because I haven't been market, uh, editing fiction for that long. So I don't know, just that there's more of us, that's my biggest thing. Definitely, and uh, yeah, I think uh, more and more it'll be really important to put out a good quality book and a well-edited yeah. book, so <laughs> you'll see more customers coming your way, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but why don't you yeah. finish up with, uh, tell us what you're working on next, and do uh, you have a new book or anything you're working on? Yeah, I, uh, I'm working on a, a fantasy book that's kind of science fiction fantasy. Um, which I just finished the outline of today and realized that what I thought was going to happen isn't going to happen. So that's exciting. <laughs> and uh, it led the way to the next book even better. Yeah, I want to make it a trilogy. Mostly because of, of listening to some of the things that you've been saying, Lindsay, about how series do better, um, you know, more, yeah, yeah, series do well. And I think that that's a really good prediction. I think that's what, what people will be most successful with there are multiple books in a series, particularly in science, science fiction and fantasy. Literary fiction tends to be one-offs um, because they're so dramatic and you don't want to be in that emotional cesspool for too long. <laughs> but, but, uh, but in genre fiction, series tend to, they seem to do a lot better. So yeah, that's what I'm working on. All right, cool. Well, let us know, let the readers or listeners know um, about your websites and, and where they can find you for editing or to check out your books. All right. Right now? Well, you can go ahead and stay. I'll put them in the show notes too if people miss it. All right. Well, my website is my name, TammyAllier.com, and my editing website is InspiredInkEditing.com. Ink as in I, as in what you put, not as in incorporated. Yeah. All right, cool. On your cool. show, it's been so awesome to talk to you all. all I right, appreciate well, all the info. I love, I love the insight. Yeah, thanks for coming on. And uh, since you're right for our core audience, there maybe you'll get some additional inquiries. Are you taking on new clients right now? Uh, yeah, all right now I'm booked through June, but after that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well it's good to have work, I guess. <laughs> Joe, Joe keeps me busy. He's a little prolific. Yeah, I think I've sent my own editor on some vacations because uh, I've pretty much got something new for her every month. So. <laughs> yeah, you are also prolific, yep. She must love right. you. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I guess that's about it. So um, bye, guys, and thanks for listening. So long. Bye. Until next time.